Hi guys, it's me Chancellor HD and welcome to another episode of the podcast where today we are reviewing yesterday's 2024 Italian Grand Prix that was a decent race, of course, and a fantastic race winner and we'll get into that later on. Um, but yeah, it wasn't maybe as exciting the on-track stuff as it maybe could have been, but we still have plenty of uh, stuff going on in the race, you know, in the midfield, up front, all of that, and we'll get into some of that in this podcast review and uh, in general it was a pretty good weekend at Monza qualifying was super close and super exciting and quite surprising given what I think we were expecting going into the race weekend and then the race w was another surprise for us um, Ferrari and Charles Leclerc taking the victory second win for Leclerc at Monza and of course, another win yet again for Ferrari at Monza. I didn't even think Ferrari would be on the podium for that race. I thought maybe they wouldn't be that far away from a podium, but I, I, I didn't think they had the pace for it. But yet again, Ferrari proving me and a lot of us wrong with having pretty strong race pace, which is something we've not seen that much from them in the you know past couple years. But really is helped or was helped by an amazing performance by Leclerc, a driver who has been performing at such a high level in the last few races. So congratulations to him. And then it was Oscar Piastri finishing in second, Lando Norris in third, fourth was Carlos Sainz, and then Hamilton fifth, Verstappen sixth, and then the rest of the field, Russell, Perez, Albon and Magnussen. So that is your, uh, or no, it wasn't Albert and Mag was it Albert and Magnussen? Yeah, it was Albert and then Magnussen. I think on track it finished Magnussen ahead of Albert. And then Magnussen, once his penalties were added, he dropped down to, I believe, P10. Kevin Magnussen, by the way, um, has a race ban for Baku uh, because he got three penalty points for an incident in the Italian Grand Prix. So looks like Oliver Behrman will be back in the, or back on the grid um for Baku and it will be his first drive for the Haas team not confirmed I don't think as of yet that it will be Behrman but I am 99% sure it will be him in that car very excited to see as well what Behrman does because he had an amazing F2 performance there last year uh taking pole and winning both races the sprint and the feature race uh so yeah kind of wait to see what he does anyway Let's get into the race and we'll start with the race winners first before I get on to McLaren because of course I have a lot to say about McLaren. For Ferrari, yeah, an amazing uh, performance by the team but I think mostly Leclerc. You really have to credit him for what happened yesterday because not only did he have a great start, Kept the McLarens honest for really throughout the race and up until especially the uh, second round of pit stops for the two McLarens. But to manage those tyres and keep them in good condition and still set some good lap times all the way to the end of the race was a super job. It was just a perfect drive from Leclerc. And that is why Ferrari are so desperate to keep hold of him and why they keep giving him you know, long contract after long contract, because when he's at his best, there are very, very, very few better than him. When he's at that level, he is truly elite, is Leclerc. That level, you know, that we saw yesterday and that we've seen for the last three or four races from him is a world championship type level. It really is. Um, yeah, it's just an incredible performance by Leclerc. Very nice move on the first lap. Um, going or uh, not uh, undercutting Norris, but kind of uh, doing a switch back on Lando Norris in the second chicane, where, of course, Piastri did his amazing move on Lando. Lando got out of shape in the middle of the chicane, and then Leclerc perfectly set his car up through the chicane in terms of the way he was handling the car to get as best an exit as possible to then take second place. And... That was very important because it allowed Leclerc to keep up with the McLarens, especially when he was within a second of Piastri for the first, what was it, like 10, 15 laps and he had the DRS. That really helped him keep up with those McLarens because if he was in third, Leclerc, at the start, maybe wouldn't have been able to keep up as well 
especially in that first stint. Because McLaren, once, I mean, Piastri had got over a second clear of Leclerc in that first stint, you saw Piastri really start to pull away from Leclerc and Ferrari. So that was super key. And then even after Lando and McLaren undercut Leclerc after the first pit stop, still kept with Norris, was only, you know, a couple seconds or so uh, behind and then Lando made a mistake at the second chicane. Leclerc got right back um, behind him. Norris then pitted again. Obviously Leclerc stayed out. Piastri then pitted again and Leclerc and Ferrari stayed out. And as I think Nib said on stream, uh, my co-commentator of course yesterday for the race watch along, what Ferrari ended up doing was their only choice if they were going to win the Grand Prix. If they had pitted again then uh, with both cars, then they would have ended up third and fourth, which, you know, still would have been a decent result. But of course, it is all about the race win. When you're a top team, you need to go out and try anything you can to get the race win, or at least the best possible result. And on strategy, that's what Ferrari did. They decided, you know what? Let's go for it. Let's see what happens. And to the surprise of many, Leclerc kept his ties together. Ferrari didn't fall off the cliff. And ended up winning the Grand Prix. So yeah, massive credit has to go to uh, Leclerc and Ferrari for that. And for once, a very, very uh, good strategy decision by Ferrari. But this is the thing I like about, I guess, the new Ferrari that we've seen in the last year. And even going back to 2023 to a certain extent. And this is why I like their team principal, Fred Vasseur, so much. Because when he took over, obviously he got rid of the previous strategist in uh was it Inaki Rueda who you know made countless mistakes but the previous team boss Bonotto refused to get rid of him when he was clearly a massive issue within the team Vasseur you know changed that and since then Ferrari I mean there's been the odd race where maybe they've not been the best strategically but I'd say at the minute Ferrari on strategy have been getting things a lot more so right than they have wrong and have been doing very well in that area which is something again they haven't been strong at for years and now you see now that you know uh you know uh, selecting i would say correct strategies and going for um certain strategies even though they're risky that you know they are worth it you're seeing now just how much better ferrari can be in terms of the results they get, even though their car, let's be honest, is still not that quick. It's not exactly a championship winning car, but with a much better strategy consistently for that team, they're able to get much better results than what we saw before, even though before they had probably a more competitive car than they've got now. But yeah, brilliant for Ferrari, and I am very excited to see the rest of this season because... Obviously, they brought a new upgrade at Monza, their last big upgrade. It was a, a new floor um, and I think a new nose mirror, and maybe a new diffuser as well. Quite a big upgrade for the Ferrari team. Now, maybe you could argue that they won the Italian Grand Prix because of that new upgrade. I wouldn't say that because, again, it's hard to tell if upgrades work at a place like Monza because it's all about, you know, power, straight line speed, stuff like that. We'll find out probably a bit more in Baku, but in Singapore especially, in three weeks, we will know for sure whether that upgrade has worked. And if it has, this will not be the last time, I'm telling you, that Ferrari win a race in 2024. And maybe, given where Red Bull are at, if Ferrari, you know, if this upgrade has worked to the, um, to the max extent, if you know what I mean by that, maybe the championship isn't over. For Ferrari, maybe they've still got a chance in the constructors or even the drivers' championship with Leclerc. But again, we'll have to see. I'm sure they'll be strong in Baku. Of course, Leclerc is so good around the streets of Baku, and Ferrari normally are um, always strong in Baku. Even last year, they were, I think, on the podium. So watch out for the Scuderia. They definitely are back. Um, but let's go on to McLaren, who I have quite a bit to say about. Um, because after qualifying, and a, a really brilliant qualifying session for McLaren, because even though we knew from practice they were going to be contenders for pole, we didn't know 
for sure how things were going to shake out. So for them to not just get pole position, but lock out the front row, it was a it's such a good result and a critical result. And I remember saying on stream going into the race that if McLaren can pull off the win and even a 1-2, then this is a crucial moment in especially the Drivers' Championship battle. And then, we, you know, we get to the start of the race. Lando didn't get the best start off the line, but it was good enough for him to cover off his teammate, which he did well. Piastri went for the outside line, decided not go uh, not to go around the outside, which was a smart thing, because if he did, then, you know, there was a much bigger uh, chance of contact at the first chicane. Um, but Piastri still had a good chicane and got a decent run on Lando. Nice slipstream up to the second chicane. And Lando... As you would do normally if you were just racing, you know, a, a, a driver from another team. Went to the inside line to cover the inside. And Piastri decided, you know what? I'm going for it. And he went for the outside. Something that only, I think, the elite drivers have pulled off, um, you know, in crucial moments. You know, an overtake around the outside there. Um at the second chicane and Piastri what a move it was didn't put a foot wrong you know didn't uh turn in too early or anything like that he executed it absolutely perfectly and that's why the McLarens didn't ha uh, make contact I know people may say uh, that Piastri took a massive risk and you know uh was lucky that it didn't end up in contact but as far as I'm concerned Piastri's brilliance in that overtake is why there wasn't any contact because if you go look at his on board he pulled it off exactly how you need to to get it done cleanly um so yeah brilliant move and then obviously Lando dropped down to third but Piastri then got into the lead eventually pulled over a second Eve Leclerc then was pulling away quite quickly his pace was very consistent and strong first round of pit stops came he pitted the last out of the top three. Lando got a bit close to him, but he was able then to slowly but surely pull away. Then Lando made that mistake at the second chicane, and Piastri was able to uh, extend his lead out to, I think, like five seconds or so. Then Lando pitted, and Piastri, at this point, I mean, he stayed out a few laps longer than Lando before Piastri, you know, made his second and final pit stop, but... Piastri was about five and a half seconds, if I remember correctly, ahead of Leclerc before Piastri made his final pit stop. Leclerc was the only driver at that point, given that, you know, um, Lando had already pitted. Leclerc was the only driver at that point that could maybe um, take on Piastri if... Leclerc and Ferrari decided to do the one-stop strategy if, obviously, McLaren went for the two-stop strategy. Um, and Piastri, of course, in the McLaren, they, you know, did go for the two-stop strategy. But they should have at least, you know, given how Leclerc, obviously, was quite far behind, but he was still close enough that if he decided to go for the one-stopper versus Piastri on a two-stopper, it was still going to be close between those two at the end. Why did McLaren not leave Oscar out there to cover off the possibility that Leclerc was going to do a one-stop race? Something that they... It was a... Was it, you know, similar to what they did back at Spa, where Piastri, I think with about 14 or 13 laps to go, something like that, had made a pit stop, was in the lead, ahead of Russell by, it was like five or six seconds. I think could have stayed out. I know, of course, uh, Russell did a one-stopper and ended up getting disqualified. That wasn't necessarily entirely the reason he got disqualified, Russell, for being underweight, you know, him doing a one-stop strategy. Because remember, Fernando Alonso did a one-stop strategy and he was fine. McLaren didn't go for the one stopper when I reckon they could have pulled it off and ended up on track at least winning the race who knows whether you know whether they would have been underweight or not I think they probably would have been fine I think it was more of just a Mercedes issue that particular day um yeah did not learn their lesson from then when in that situation at Spa should have kept 
Piastri out and gone for the one stopper when it was clearly viable. And I remember back at Spa, Piastri said his tyres felt brilliant. Here at Monza, though, even though Oscar, before his pit stop, he did say on the radio his front left was pretty dead. If they had left him out, there is no way in hell that Piastri's tyres were much worse than Leclerc's. Because remember, when Piastri and Leclerc made their first pit stops, Piastri pitted two laps later than Leclerc. So if Leclerc could get to the end, I am 100% sure Piastri could have. And if he had gone to the end without pitting for a second time, Oscar Piastri would have won the Grand Prix. Probably by, I don't know, seven or eight seconds. Something like that. But McLaren assumed, I guess, that Leclerc and Ferrari were bound to pit. They decided to go for the pit stop and Ferrari, rightly with, what was it, like 12, 13 laps to go when Piastri pitted, decided, you know what, fuck it, we're going to go for the one-stopper. And they pulled it off because Piastri wasn't able to gain enough time back on Leclerc because those hard tyres on Leclerc were still in good enough condition to do decent enough lap times to keep him by lap 53 in the lead. So, strategically, poor from McLaren. If you look at the other elite teams that have won championships lately, you know, Red Bull and Mercedes, what they normally do when they're in the lead by a few seconds is just cover off the car behind them. And if, you know, the car behind them doesn't pit, they'll stay out, especially if they've got one lap or two lap fresher tyres, which normally they do because, you know, if they're leading from the start, if the second place person pits, normally they'll pit a lap after to cover it off and make sure they have, you know, one lap fresher tyres. In this situation, all McLaren had to do was cover off Ferrari and just, you know, if Ferrari decided to pit, then great. Piastri then, you know, you could bring in. But if Ferrari decided to stay out, cover it off by keeping Piastri out. That's all they had to do. And again, that is what the elite teams do. When they're comfortably in the lead, all you have to do is cover off your rival. And if you do that, you'll win. But... Pitting first and just assuming that your rival's going to do the same thing is extremely naive. And it just screams that to me that McLaren have a still a like a midfield team mentality. When again, if, if that was Red Bull or Mercedes in that in that position, they would have either waited till till Ferrari had pitted for the second time and then pitted, or they would have just stayed out to cover off Leclerc, possibly doing a one-stop uh, strategy. But McLaren didn't do that because, again, strategically, they haven't got that mindset that the other elite teams have. They may have the best car, McLaren, but they definitely don't have the mindset of you know the best team. Uh, that they should have, because they've clearly got the best car, they're going to be the best team for the rest of the season, you know, most likely. That's the mentality they should have. But, yeah, I, I feel so sorry for Piastri, as I said in the race watch along, because he drove so well, that overtake at the start was just amazing. I know on stream I uh, did quite a um, weird, high-pitched <laughs> voice when... Piastri went for the move, but I was genuinely amazed he went for it and was able to pull it off because uh, I thought, you know, there was no way that it, it, it was going to happen. But he did it and he went for it. But yeah, I, I, I'm sad for Piastri. But he drove brilliantly. He deserved better, but McLaren fucked him over, let's be honest. Um, but Lando Norris, let's go on to him. Yet another race where he just did not at all get the best out of himself and did not achieve the best result possible in that car. At the start, you know, maintained the lead well into turn one. That whole start, you know, he, he did well. And then with the second chicane, there's been quite a bit of debate after the race as, you know, should McLaren have told Piastri not to pass Norris? And all that because, you know, the driver's championship and all of that stuff. At the end of the day, McLaren have said that their two drivers are two number one drivers and that their drivers are still free to race. 
which I think is the right decision because McLaren's focus, remember, is not the Drivers' Championship. I mean, they love Lando, but they don't love him that much that they're going to focus more on the Drivers' Championship than the Constructors' Championship. McLaren's main focus is the Constructors' Championship, which they are going to win, most likely. Yet again, outscoring Red Bull by quite a few points yesterday at Monza. That's what matters to them. Yeah, they didn't win. They'll be disappointed. But they still outscored Red Bull by a lot. And they still, I think, they know that as long as they don't have any, you know, uh, DNFs, you know, a load of those or anything, they should win the Constructors' Championship. That's what matters to them. That's why they're saying the drivers, you know, they're free to race. There's no team orders or anything like that. And that, you know, they trust the drivers to, you know, to not hit each other and crash on track. And, you know, Lando definitely, I think, was, I wouldn't say upset at Piastri going for that move and overtaking him. But would have been definitely miffed at what happened. And, you know, he came out after the race Lando and said, oh, you know... If I had braked one meter later, we would have crashed. Once again, playing into the, the online meme on Twitter, Lando Norif, where all he talks about is if this and if that. At the end of the day, he didn't break one meter later, and they got through just fine. So who cares about what would have happened if this had happened and if this had happened? Because it didn't happen. What happened happened, and Piastri cleanly took the lead yeah it was close but it's always going to be close at that corner these cars are very wide and to go round the outside at chicane it's always going to be close but you know they didn't crash yeah they could have but they didn't so let's not talk about well they could have crashed the two drivers are free to race that's what mclaren have said and i agree with that decision because there is no guarantee that lando norris is going to win the championship you know they need piastri to be going for it and be at his best to help them win the Constructors' Championship. They can't have Piastri, you know, uh, just letting Lando go ahead. And, you know, you can't have Oscar limiting his own performance to help Lando when that might not be beneficial for the Constructors' Championship. I mean, you know, if Oscar had... Um, you know, uh, uh, decided to stick behind Lando for the whole race, McLaren might have ended up yesterday with a worse result than what they got. So, you know, you can't be doing that. Um, and then Lando, after that, you know, his pace wasn't that great, I have to say, in the first stint. McLaren went for the undercut, worked out very well. Then Lando got into the groove, set some fastest laps, closed in on Piastri. But then made a big mistake at the second chicane. It, it was, again, a bit weird. It, it looked like he was going to make the corner, but it was like he wasn't sure that he was going to without locking up. So then he decided to go to the you know escape road, but then he cost himself two seconds. Um, and then Leclerc was right back on his tail. Then he had to pit, probably a bit earlier than he would have wanted to. Um, and then had to come through and pass, what was it, Verstappen, um, and he passed Carlos Sainz towards the end to finish on the podium in third. Very lucky, by the way, as well, that he didn't get a uh, penalty for speeding in the pit lane, because I was sure when he entered the pits for the first time, when he was like, locking up and he hit that bollard, I was sure he was going to get a, uh, a... I keep saying drive through penalty, because that's what they used to get for speeding in the pit lane. Um, I, I was sure he was going to get a penalty, but... Somehow he didn't, so that is lucky, because if he had got that penalty, he probably would have finished behind Carlos Sainz in fourth place. But yet another race where Lando Norris has underperformed, underachieved, and even though, yes, he got the fastest lap, and he took, what was it, eight points out of Verstappen, which is still good, it wasn't enough. Lando should have been... Given that McLaren made the strategy error of doing a two-stop, Lando should have been at least in second place. And if, you know, with him taking the fastest lap, if he had finished second instead of third, 
then the gap would be down instead of it being down to 62 points, it would be down to 59. And you never know, three points could make a difference by the time we get to the final race in the middle of December. So, yeah. Um, Lando, once again, just not a good enough performance. And I think, honestly, you know, if we look at the last few races where Lando has not got the result he really should have got, in terms of his qualifying performances, I think mostly he's done well with, with qualifying. Um, you know, especially since we've come back from the summer break. His two qualifying laps for pole position in Zandvoort Monza, I thought were great. But if you look at his race performances, let's say since the Spanish Grand Prix to now, he is very lucky that he has the car he has. Because if he was in a Ferrari or a Mercedes, which is not as quick, Lando wouldn't be getting on the podium even with these performances. I mean, Zandvoort, yeah, was great. Um, I mean, Hungary, his pace was good, but it was just the start, really, that he that he messed up. Or uh, I'm not sure you would say messed up because I think he did have a, a technical glitch with the car, but you know what I mean? The pace was still there with him in Hungary. But other than those races, it just hasn't been... It just hasn't been good enough. You know, the gap, again, it's 62 points. McLaren clearly have the faster car than Red Bull. The, that gap will come down, whether Lando does end up winning the championship. Who knows? I'm excited to see what happens. But that gap of 62 points, even Max will know this for sure, that that gap should be way lower. If Lando had, let's say, um, you know, if he had won in Spain and had won at Silverstone then, I mean, that's, what, an extra 14 points. That would be, he'd be only 48 points behind. And then if he finishes second yesterday with the fastest lap, then that's another three points knocked off. And, yeah, 45 points behind. So, it's just, again, as I said, he's lucky he's in a McLaren because his race performances right now are not good enough. Leclerc, Verstappen, Piastri, Hamilton, Russell, when it comes to race day, they're just performing better than him. And they have been for the last few races, I would say, most of them consistently. And even you could maybe throw Carlos Sainz in there, to a degree. But, yeah, it's not good enough. It is not good enough from Lando. If he wants to win the championship, he has to deliver. McLaren have given him the best car on the grid. And McLaren, by the time we get to the end of the season, I think you could probably say that McLaren for most of this year have had the best car. If Lando Norris does not win the championship, he has only himself to blame. He cannot be blaming McLaren or whatever, or his teammate or Max races too hard or whatever these bullshit excuses are. It is down to him. If you want to win the championship, Lando, go out there and deliver your absolute best. Because your absolute best in that car should easily be good enough to win the championship. I mean, Max in the Red Bull, I mean, I think Red Bull at the minute would be happy probably in Baku just to be on the podium after what happened yesterday. So, you know, they've got their own issues, Red Bull, in terms of on-track performance, are not necessarily your main rivals at the moment. So, again, if you don't win the championship, Lando, it's all your fault. I don't want to hear anything, you know, any excuses or if. Because, again, that's why he's uh, been given that slander name on, uh, on X or Twitter, Lando Norif. Because, you know, if this, if that, fuck that. Go out there, give us your best, and in that car, your best will be good enough and you will be the world champion of 2024. But if you don't give us your best in the race, consistently, like you have been since the say, Spanish Grand Prix, where maybe only two of those races since then he's given us his best, if you keep up like that, you won't win the championship because, you know, do you think Red Bull and Max are going to be finishing sixth every race from now on? No, 
There will be a race or two, at least, between now and the end of the season where Red Bull figure it out and they're back up there fighting for, you know, the win. I'm sure of that. Red Bull are not going to be in this position for the rest of the year. They will figure it out. They're still an elite team. They, in terms of, you know, um, I would say trackside performance, I still would put Red Bull ahead of McLaren. So... Get your act together, Lando, because if you want to win the championship, you can't keep blowing these opportunities to get, you know, the the maximum result you should be getting. Yesterday, again, you know, even if he was in the lead and he had not lost the lead at the start, you know, McLaren, if they had still gone for the two-stop strategy, then, you know, McLaren would have screwed him over and he would have ended up in second. But still, you didn't get the best result you could have. We saw at Spa, he probably... You know, with the pace he had in clear air, he probably could have been on the podium there, but he wasn't. Silverstone should have won. Austria should have won. Spain should have won. I don't want to hear any more should have, if, and all this shit. So, yeah. Just give us your best, and that will be good enough. Anyway... Let's move off of McLaren, because I've had plenty to say. Uh, we've been talking about them for like 20 minutes. Um, let's go on to the other couple top teams. Um, I think we'll start with Red Bull instead of Mercedes, because I mean, Mercedes, there wasn't really much to talk about from their race, to be honest. Red Bull, um, they started both cars 7th and 8th on the hard tyre. I think that was the right decision with Red Bull, I think the issue yesterday was just they just didn't have any pace. I don't think the strategy was an issue. Obviously, Max had a slow pit stop that he was very angry about, which, you know, wasn't great. But strategically, I don't think Red Bull got anything wrong. They just were too slow. I mean, Max ended up 37 seconds, I think it was, behind Leclerc at the end of the race and was like 13 seconds behind Hamilton. So... Even if Max had gone for a one-stop strategy, I don't think that would have worked. I think Lewis probably would have overtaken him at the end. So, what Max did was the best he could do. Sixth place. That's, that's, that's where Red Bull were at Monza. There was a couple encouraging things, though, coming out of Red Bull after the race, where they uh, Max and the engineers believe that they know the what the issues are now and are going to make alterations to the setup that they think will put them back at least, you know, closely following or following to an extent McLaren. Um, so, yeah, we'll see if that, you know, if they do return to you know good performance level in Baku. You would hope so. But at the minute with Red Bull, it's difficult to know just how quick they're going to be weekend to weekend. Because we end up expecting them to be somewhere and then they end up being somewhere totally different, it feels like. And they still... Haven't won a race since that Spanish Grand Prix, which was, what, like 10 weeks ago. So, still concerning times at Red Bull. Uh, Constructors' Championship-wise, yeah, they're still in the lead, but they're not going to win the Constructors' Championship. That's McLaren's to lose. On the driver's side, though, Max is still getting the best results he possibly can. 62 points is the gap. Looking at the next two races, which is a back-to-back before we have a month's break, uh, until we then go to uh, back to North America, if Max can beat Lando in either of the next two races, even if it's like Max finishing second and Lando finishing third, that's what he needs. He can't afford for Lando to keep beating him race in, race out, because... Even if Lando's not getting the wins as much as he should be, if Lando's finishing second and Max is finishing fifth or sixth, you know, those points are still going to come down by quite a bit and it's still going to get very close towards the end of the season, which, of course, Max and Red Bull want to avoid. So I think for Baku, the operation there is just, you know, obviously trying to get the best result they can, but for Max, it is operation beat Lando. That, that is, I think, what his aim has to be. As long as he beats Lando, whether that's winning the race or just second, third, whatever. As long as he beats Lando in Baku in the race, then I think he'll be happy with that. So we'll see what happens. Um, 
How competitive will Red Bull be in Baku? Honestly, they should be one of the top two, three quickest teams there. But again, you know, at Monza, I thought Red Bull would have the best car. But they didn't. They were... I mean, Verstappen actually finished closer to Alonso, who finished in 11th, than he did to Leclerc, who won. So, who knows at this point with Red Bull. But like I said, if Max can beat Lando in one of the next two races, then that will really help his championship bid. Because I'd say he needs to keep the lead over 50 points for as long as he can. Because if Lando can come out of the Singapore Grand Prix in three weeks and the gap is 40 or 45 points, then I think, you know, um, Max's championship bid could fall away quite quickly, given how quickly uh, or how quick the McLaren car is. But uh, yeah, not a great weekend for Red Bull. Um, We'll see what they do in Baku and hopefully from their point of view, they're back to some sort of decent performance. Mercedes-Benz, it's difficult to say really with the race. I mean, yeah, fifth and seventh, bad result. But it's difficult to say whether they would have actually been contending up there for the win. Uh, Russell at the start ended up clipping the back of Piastri, I think it was. It wasn't, you know, uh, anything that anyone should have got a penalty for. It's just a racing incident. Unfortunate. For Russell, I thought Russell's pace though was pretty good to come back through and still end up, um, you know, finishing where he did. So his pace was good, but again, whether he could have won the race, I have no idea, to be honest. I think though, if he had decided, let's say Russell was fourth at the end of lap one and had no front wing damage. If he had decided to go for a one-stop strategy along with Leclerc, I think Russell could have finished on the podium and maybe even in second place, which would have made McLaren's day even worse, especially Norris's day. Um, But could he have won the race? Again, it's too hard to say. It's, uh, you know, only something that you'd know in an alternate universe, I'm afraid. But that's the way it was for him. For Lewis Hamilton, he cost himself in qualifying, having a decent race. Um, And then, I mean, at the start of the race, he wasn't really um, looking that great. Pace in the first stint, and even the second stint, was not very good. Uh, Ended up finishing in fifth, which I would say is a decent result, considering how his qualifying went and the first half of his race went. But I I think Hamilton, uh, pretty disappointed. For his race weekend because it could have been better and maybe if he had qualified fourth maybe he could have been on the podium but he wasn't so yeah disappointing for Mercedes the pace was there but race day it, it just fell apart so yeah uh, we'll see in Baku where they're at not quite sure yet um, where I think they'll be um, but Hopefully close enough that they can fight for the win. Because that's where we want to see them. Uh, But yeah, those are the top teams. Um, Yeah, congrats to Albon finishing the points of Williams. Williams on the up with their new upgrades. Um, So watch out for them for the rest of the season. Brilliant drive from Magnussen, even though he's banned now (laughs) from the next race. I think he'll see it more as a vacation than a ban. Uh, But I have to shout out again, Franco Colapinto. Debut for Williams, 18th he started, finished in 12th, and only finished, I think it was around 20 seconds behind his teammate. And I maintain, if he had done his absolute best laps in qualifying, had not made that mistake at the end of Q1, I think Colapinto could have ended up in the top 10. It was a very impressive performance by him. And it was nice to see that they actually showed him live, overtaking, I think, was it Gasly into Turn 1? That was nice to see. Um, So yeah, very impressed. And hopefully in Baku, um, he can keep that up. One thing we have to add though with Colapinto is obviously he has raced around Monza before. So it's a familiar racetrack. Once we get to the less familiar ones, it might get a bit more difficult for him. And I think there's quite a lot of tracks coming up that he's not familiar with. So yeah, we will see how he gets on. But 
That is the Italian Grand Prix and the European season is now over. Obviously, I'll uh, show on the screen the championship standings as we now head into a double header. Not uh, uh, this weekend, but obviously starting next weekend. Um, Baku first up and then Singapore the week after. And then after that, a four week break until the US Grand Prix in Austin, Texas. Uh, so again, I um, I did say this on stream, but I'll say it again in case you guys missed it. I uh, So obviously this podcast, you know, you know it's going to be uploaded. And then after this, the next piece of content on the channel will be for the Azerbaijan Grand Prix. And my plan for the Azerbaijan Grand Prix is the same as what I did for Monza, I'm going to do a qualifying watch along for Baku and a race watch along for Baku. And then the day after, I'll upload a podcast reviewing the race. And then for the Singapore Grand Prix, I am still only going to do a qualifying watch along. And then on Monday, of course, I'll upload a podcast reviewing the uh, Singapore Grand Prix. So, yeah. Um, thank you guys for coming along for this podcast and all the content over the Italian Grand Prix weekend. Hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to smash the like button on this video. It would be great if you could. Make sure to subscribe to the channel for more content like this. And until next time, guys, it has been me, Chazer HD. Goodbye. <laughs>